Yeah, it's working okay, great. Okay, everybody, welcome to the Houston Beekeeper Association. I'm Joe Powers, I'm your president. Mike Simmons here, our vice president, Kyle Wolf, our treasurer, our um, secretary, and then uh, Joe uh, Brown, our secretary, just got, our plane just landed late from Cincinnati, not gonna make it tonight, so. Uh, anyway, uh, welcome to the meeting. We've got a great speaker tonight. I'll let Mike in just a second, just with a few announcements. Um, we have our mentoring program going on. We want to try to match up new beekeepers or beekeepers who don't have much experience with a beekeeper with a mentor. We want to try to make those matches in November so that uh, that's our last meeting in the year, basically, is our November meeting so that you can uh, have the whole, whole winter to talk to your mentor about what to order and all that kind of stuff to kind of get yourself set up for the spring for the whole beekeeping sort of season, which runs basically, you know, uh, Valentine's Day till, till uh, Thanksgiving. So let's see, upcoming events. Uh, this coming Saturday, we're doing a field day at Mike's Apiary out in uh, Baytown. And uh, he's gonna be doing a bunch of stuff, showing how to do it to basically roll the roll mites, check for that. He's got a couple of different methods. Um, James brought a cool Romite smoker kit. I don't know what you call that thing. Instavat with him. So we can look at that, go and look at that after the meeting. Um, this Tuesday, our next Tuesday, the 27th, is Harris County Beekeeper Association meeting. Uh, then our next meeting is October 18th. Um, and our topic's going to be uh, equipment construction and a demo on doing the equipment construction. Also, that meeting, we need to, if you want to nominate somebody for president, vice president, whatever, our, our, our elections are in November. Or if you want to change any bylaws, suggest those kinds of suggestions. So you come up in October. Everybody has enough time to think about it. And then we're going to have a, 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 a beekeeper meetup for our club um, on the 22nd of October. We will start off at the Texas Bee Supply in Dayton, and they'll give us a whole demonstration of what's going on out there. They'll have a interactive class, a honey tasting, live bee viewing, uh, run you through their gift shop, which I hope that I guess they want you to spend some money. And then after we've done that, we're going to head over to Lake Houston Brewery for uh, lunch and a couple of uh, cold adult beverages. And then on November 3rd through 5th is the Texas Beekeeper Association Annual Convention, and that's going to be at the Mayburn Convention Center in Temple, Temple, Texas. So that's what's coming up. Mike, I'll let you our speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to remind everyone if they're not going to the um, field trip, B School is a Saturday. Rather, Sally B School is mine. Oh, okay. I didn't yeah. make that list. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I noticed that the other day. I picked a little bad day to do that. Yeah, it's a great school if you yeah, have to. Yeah, I heard a lot of good things about the press. Okay. Really nice. um, also, if you're going to come out to the Texas Beach Supply thing, if you bring a jug, they sell uh, they sell the jugs too. They're kind of pricey. Um, if you make your own pollen patties, they sell uh, the Pro Sweet. It's the best thing you can use to make patties with. And that's one of the few places you can get it by the gallon. Um, so, our speaker today is going to be Dr. Oster. Did I say that correctly? Yes. Okay. Uh, he's going to cover some stuff on bee products and human health. Uh, Dr. Oster is an assistant professor of practice at the University of Texas of San Antonio. He currently supervises the cure program of the integrated bot. Integrated Biology Department. Uh, he specializes in medicinal use of honey with a strong PhD background in gene therapy, molecular and cellular biology, bioinformatics, in words, biotechnology and biochemistry research. He has taken this knowledge and applied it to the unique and biological and chemical makeup of different monofloral honey from around the world, allowing to unlock the hidden knowledge of age-old wisdom regarding the healing benefits of honey. His current research is helping to identify U.S.-based honey sources that contain high, high bioactivity levels and healing properties. Second, so get our technology right. Annual, right? Great. So uh, it was a long drive. Actually, I just class all day and then just <laughs> had the hit road. I'm glad I'm not going to slam it tonight. So I'll just stay 
Anyway, so my name is Farhad Oster. As uh, Mike, uh, I'm, I'm introduced. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. So, um, as mentioned, I'm working on the medicinal properties of honey. Most of my research is focused on honey, and I'm studying the, the, during the last 10 years. So, uh, during my PhD and postdoc, I mostly work on cellular and molecular biology and cell signaling, kind of like most of the deep biology things, the detailed one. But in, uh, as of 2012, uh, I was introduced to honey as a medicine. And um, actually, this is kind of coinciding with the time that uh, I, I went to Turkey, uh, which is my home country. And there was a new Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics building opening. And they have a honey research center there. And uh, I was so excited to be part of it because um, during my postdoc, I studied on wound healing. So, sorry, I studied on cleft palate. So as you may know, the uh, palate uh, grows vertically and then horizontally to complete it. If it is not completed, then it ends up with cleft palate and cleft lip. So the mechanism of cleft palate and cleft lip is very much similar with the wound healing and, well, and also the cancer metastasis. So they all have the palate mesenchymal transition. So while I was looking into those, I came across with honey as a very effective tool for wound healing. And it was pretty famous in my home country as well in Turkey. So uh, then, um, I mean, I went to Turkey and I uh, initiated the department and as well as the honey research center. And uh, we analyzed about 400 different honey samples from different parts of Turkey and as well as Europe and some Asian countries. And then in 2016, I came to the United States and I was the Alma College, Michigan for a year. And I worked on, um, I taught biochemistry and other courses, but majorly I just, um, I worked on the uh, Michigan honey. So we collect about 150 samples and analyze them. So I'll talk about those a little bit. And today's subject was bee products and uh, human health. Uh, to be honest, I don't have so much experience in uh, pollen and uh, royal jelly and propolis. I have my like research experience, uh, like I like kind of review experience. I'll also give some idea about those, but main focus of my presentation will be about the honey. So I just wanted to give heads up at first. So, uh, but if you have questions about other new products, I will do my best to answer those. And again, the, the major thing is that I'm focusing on is the evidence base. So it's not only by personal experience because all, all the time we hear that like this new product, like the honey has helped me to uh, heal from this uh, issue. And I mean, heal from the disease or pollen has helped me to have uh, fix my gastrointestinal tract or propolis help for this. Yes, these are personal, um, experience and these are highly valuable but once you don't bring them into the lab and then work on the cellular level the animal level and also clinical trial level then it, it may become a whole thing for the whole community or whole humanity so then it will make more sense in terms of the modern medicine as well so i'll briefly talk about medicinal use of honey in the history and today uh, how many of you have known that honey can be a bioweapon Somewhere in, okay. Uh, yes, how do you know it's can be like? But you may have to use it to win over somebody. Oh, yeah, it's, it's okay, it's, it's an antibacterial, but how can you use honey to defeat another army or like other group? Yes. Uh, Romans use it, who's uh, a Yes, there you go, you gotta start from here. <laughs> okay. So in the 67 BC, Romans and Persians, they were keep fighting each other. I mean, as the, I mean, countries, right? So the, um, in this, uh, this time, so Roman, uh, the Persian king was the, the Mithridates, and he's the Rome's deadliest enemy. And then the Pompey the Great was the commander for the Roman army. So uh, Mithridates used to live in the northeastern part of today's Turkey or Anatolia, and Romans were in the west part of Turkey or today's Turkey and at that time Anatolia. So what happened is that during the, uh, the war, I mean, so this is where the Romans were mostly residing or like concurring, and then the Persians were living on this side and this area. So this is today's Iran. So Mithridates was the commander for the Pontus part, which is the Northeast side and which is by the coast. So what happened is that Romans, I mean, wanted to beat them because uh, they had several battles. And then because Mithridates known about the area pretty well. So instead of going through the, this, high plateau areas, which has a very like, bad winter. So he kind of chose the way through the Northeast uh, of Turkey, today's Turkey. And then at that time, so, in the, uh, so the Romans had just followed them and it was almost like the fall time. So the winter was coming up. So in this area, there's a special uh, flower, which is called Rhododendron ponticum. 
Look at the name, it is Ponticum, but it's from Pontus of the Romans. And uh, rhododendron is, means that the, uh, the rose of the forest, or it's also known as the Comar flower. So this flower looks very beautiful. I mean, it's like mass purple, it has yellow, it has white, different colors. But this uh, flower has, in, within its nectar, there's something very special, which is a toxic material for human beings. So what they did was, uh, it, uh, the bees, when they collect the nectar of these ones, they make this psychedelic honey, or which is also known as mad honey. So this honey is, when it is uh, consumed by humans, it causes severe uh, issues, especially uh, it allows the, the aorta uh, to expand, and then in the, by this way, it drops the uh, blood pressure. And then due to low blood pressure, it starts convulsion, uh, nausea, vomiting, and uh, consciousness is lost. So this is what happens. I mean, the, uh, the Mitradetes, because he, he is familiar, and he's also known as the king of the poisons. Because Mitradetes is the commander. He used small amounts of uh, poisons throughout his life to get uh, used to, to get immunized against the poisons. And he got so much immunized that when he was captured by the Romans at through the end of his life, he wanted to commit suicide with the poison in his ring. And he ate the poison, but he couldn't die because <laughs> he has immunity. So, and then he asked his daughter to stab him and then he has died because of stabbing by his own daughter. So, I mean, so immunity is not always good. <laughs> anyway, he couldn't even commit suicide <laughs> by his own. But anyway, so he knows this and then he knows that mad honey makes these things to the people, but local people are very familiar with this. And then they use mad honey small amounts, of, you know, for the therapeutic purposes, like to control their high blood pressure. Even now it is being used for that purpose. So on the roads where the Romans were coming, so uh, um, uh, Mithradates has asked the villagers to put honey pots. And then uh, when the Romans were passing by, so they said, oh, the villagers love us so much. So they are welcoming us with honey when we are entering the villages. They said, well, okay, these guys love us. And then they just indulge in honey. And again, because of these um, psychedelic properties of the uh, uh, rhododendron or the mad honey, so they end up like this. So they lost their consciousness. I mean, they were convoluted. And again, all these things because of the mad honey, they went through that. And you may expect what the Mithradates and his army did. So they were able to chop them off and then they won the, uh, they won the war for, through this way. So this is one of the shortest war. And then it is the first time that honey has been used as a bioweapon because you, yeah, I mean, you made your enemies um, convulsed and then uh, they lost the consciousness and then you are uh, on top of it. So this is what the main hand does. But again, locally, the people in the Northeast, uh, Northeast of Turkey today, they use med honey and it's also found in Nepal and Himalayas, I think. So they use med honey to control their blood fish. Anyway, so uh, we all know about the definition of honey, but the literature definition is a sweet compound that has been produced by honeybees through the process of uh, the, in the abdomen. So as you may know, honeys have, like, honeybees have two abdomens. One is, uh, they're all connected actually. One is the, uh, the gut for the uh, honey and for the nectar uh, processing. And the other one is for their own digestion. And then uh, the nectar can come from either the flowers or they can become honeydew, like they can come from the pieces of the aphids, which is a white sugar material. And then the um, honeybees collect them and then convert them into honey in their hives. And honey has been used as a food, but mostly because of the um, you know, hardness of accessibility. So honey was mostly used for therapeutic purposes because it was very hard to get. So people used to climb on the mountains or climb on the trees, which are like 100 feet high, um, I'm told. And then they were like making uh, uh, ropes over the cliffs to get those, you know, the honey from the beehives. So it was a very hard thing. That place called honey hunting because they were hunting the honey, not like beekeeping or other things until the Egyptians. So uh, this is a nice video that shows yeah, so how the honey is being done. And I can't follow the glasses, of course. It is regurgitation, so we are eating bee vomit, actually, as we eat the honey soup. Oh, no, sorry. 
Anyway, so this happens about before the nectar has been transferred into the, uh, the cell of the hive, it goes through 200 bees, like from the one stomach to another, one stomach to another. So they continue the digestion of, because the sugar is the nectar, and it has to be converted to fructose and glucose, and this can be done in the, by the enzyme, which is the invertase in the abdominal of bees. Okay, when it is done, uh, they, I mean, they make it, uh, they decrease the moisture of the by fanning, and then, yeah, the fan has just started. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then after that, so, that's, uh, uh, so the, 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 the moisture goes down to 16%, 70%, and they kept it up. There are some honeys which are 13%. I had one of those in the lab. It doesn't crystallize, but you cannot pour it because it's very, very strong, like a, like a paste honey. So again, I mentioned about honey was hunted throughout the uh, history. So the earliest paintings or carvings um, in the Valencia Spain, it's about 8,000 to 15,000 years old. It has been dated back that much. So this is the, um, the, the, the from the hunter-gatherers. They are hunting honey from the cliff by a rope ladder. And then the, probably it's a kind of smoker or maybe a basket kind of a thing. So trying to collect the honey from those. And honey has been used by Sumerian, Babylonian, Hittite, so which is the Mesopotamian. These are the major civilizations in the, in the Mesopotamian area, like today's Middle East. And then uh, Greeks and Romans also used honey, and they have very high reverence. So they put, they make coins uh, with the bees, and then they even have like those necklaces, the golden necklaces that has been uh, you know collected from their graves. And Indian and Chinese, they also used honey. They even make poems about the honey. So the Indian, uh, the, the Rig Vedas, it's talking about let our trees be honey, let the sun be honey, let the cow, even the cows make honey. So, uh, so it's like highly revered uh, product, I mean, or the uh, food and therapeutic agent. And also in the Chinese medicine, uh, honey is being used. So the Egyptians, the Egyptians are the first civilization who were domesticated the bees, and this is how the beekeeping kind of started. So before that, it was hunting the honey, and during the Egyptian time, it was mostly the beekeeping. And it goes back all the way to uh, 3100 BC. So, I mean, beekeeping it has all this factor of years. So, and then in the hieroglyphs of the Egyptians, they had the bees, and then they even um, serve the honey to their gods, the, to the Egyptian gods. And even today, um, you know, have you heard about like the oldest honey on earth? Or maybe should, should I ask like that? Do you, do you think if honey has a, a shelf life? There's no expiration. They found the, the honey in the tombs of the Egyptians. Yes, very good. So the Tutankhamun's pyramid. So when they found out a pot of honey and next to the uh, next to the, the mummy, uh, Tutankhamun's mummy, and then uh, they found out like it is about three thousand. I mean, it's, it's from thirty one hundred. So it's about three thousand years old, and it's still still edible. Did not lose its nutritional values even the therapeutic values. So honey doesn't have an exp expiration date. So it's, uh, thanks to Egyptians. I mean, we learned it. So and also Turks. And Arabs and Persians again they use honey. So this uh, the scholar here is called Avicenna or Avicenna. So Avicenna is a uh, is a polymath, and he was the he was considered as king of medicine, like above Hippocrates and Galen by some of the authorities, because his book, the, which is called the Canon of Medicine, so there should be one hand here. The Canon of Medicine, his book was a medical textbook in Europe for five hundred years. So I don't know if you have heard any other medical textbooks which can be used for 500 other than the you know, religious scriptures. But his book was, even it was banned for so many years and uh, because of its medicinal thing, but, um, and Avicenna was like, was also known as Ibn Sina. So it's, it's, he's also considered one of the initiators of the Renaissance in Europe. So he was like Persian say he's Persian, Turks say he's Turks, Arab say he's Arab, but whatever, I mean, he is a value for humanity and then, so in his book of Canon of Medicine, in the book two, he's the pharmaceuticals, and he uses honey for 35 different uh, recipes so that for the healing of the human beings. And also in the religious scriptures, honey is like highly mentioned. Uh, so in the Torah, the land of Israel, it literally means the land of milk and honey. And also in the Rosh Hashanah, according to Jewish culture, uh, so the apple is dipped into the honey to celebrate the salvation from the desert of 40 years. And in the Bible, when the Jesus, uh, Jesus was um, resurrected from death, and he asked his disciples that um, for food, and his disciples brought him honey and um, fish, 
and then Jesus ate the honey to show that he is not a spirit, but he is a real human when he was resurrected. And honey is eat no honey because it's good for your health. And in the Quran and the Muslims book, so there is a chapter called An Mahal the Bee. And then in that chapter, um, it is uh, clearly mentioned that uh, in there, within the bodies of the uh, bees or honeybees, there's a drink of varying colors, which is an indication for different colors of honey. And then it says there is a healing for mankind. So it is like, it is clearly mentioned in, in, this, in the scripture that it is a healing. So it's a treatment for all different diseases. And some of the scholars interpret this like different colors of honey can be a healing for different type of diseases. So when I will cover about different properties of honey, I will touch base those, how they can be different. So as you know, honey has, like honey is not only sugar. So there are like, there's at least nine different types of sugar in honey. So uh, glucose and fructose are the major ones, which is about 39% of honey, oh, sorry, about four, uh, okay, glucose is 31 and uh, fructose is about 38. So, and then this differs from honey to honey. Some of the, uh, like the acacia honey or sunflower honey, they have more glucose than the fructose. But at the end, so this is the major sugar. And then there's sucrose, maltose, tronose, and some other uh, carbohydrates inside honey. But this is only 84%. So we have the other 16% about, it's about water, but in addition to this one, we have so many compounds, which is that more than 200 compounds has been identified to, to be found in the, inside the honey. And among these, there are amino acids, there are proteins, there are enzymes, vitamins, some minerals, but the most important one, which makes the honey for a healing, for a treatment, is the presence of polyphenols and flavonoids. So most of these polyphenols and flavonoids, they are currently they are being used for different medical treatments in modern medicine. So those active ingredients are being used for treatment of, like most of our antibacterial, also they are used for anti-inflammatory properties. And most of the properties of honey comes from these uh, uh, mineral, uh, sorry, the polyphenols and the flavonoids within them. And this will change from uh, nectar to nectar because different flowers or different uh, plants and different trees they have uh, varying amounts of these chemicals, the polyphenols and flavonoids. And then when the honey, when the honeybees go and forage from the, from them and collect the nectar, they're also bringing these polyphenols and flavonoids into the honey. And then these, uh, and then when we consume honey, we're also consuming these very uh, important, uh, like very uh, health, healthy uh, products. And then honey has been used as a medicine, as I mentioned, I mean, for throughout the history, but let's dig in more what it's been used for. So first of all, I mean, this was, was going to my uh, overall subject today, but I'll just uh, talk about different honeybee products. So there's a field called apitherapy. How many of you heard of this word before, apitherapy? Okay, great, so yeah, beekeepers, we all know about this. So uh, apitherapy is using the, uh, like Apis mellifera, so the Latin name for the bee, and using the bee products for treatment of different diseases. So uh, among them, honey is the most known one, but we also have propolis. So propolis literally means protection of the city. So pro is for protection, propolis is uh, city. So it is protecting the city, which means that honeybees use propolis to protect, I mean, to cover the inside of their hive. So in the wildlife, the propolis is uh, like make kind of an envelope inside the trees. As you know, like in the feral, feral bees, they mostly live inside the trees or different like, um, you know, openings or crevices that they find. So when they go inside a tree to protect themselves from fungal infection and protect themselves from other bacterial infection, which can come from the tree, or uh, again, also to uh, adjust the thermostat I mean, or the temperature of the uh, inside their hive in the, uh, in the tree, so they cover it with the uh, propolis. And by this way, they are not interacted uh, with the, they are not exposed directly to the tree, but the propolis is the one that they are finally extension. And uh, as humans, I mean, when we do beekeeping, uh, normally when you have like smooth uh, beehives without any, you know, the crevices or so, so the, the, the bees will not cover them with propolis. So for them to make propolis, you need to make some kind of, kind of scratches in the beehive so then the bees will make it and smoothen it. So it's kind of a paste or it's kind of like something to protect the beehives. And also it has been found the, the health of the bee colony is correlated with the amount of propolis inside their hive. So the, the more propolis they produce, the more propolis they, you know, they use for coverage, 
So the less they get disease and their immune system is much stronger. So according to some studies, I mean, pro, uh, covering the, I mean, allowing the honeybees to cover their hives with propolis may be a good uh, way of fighting with different diseases like American fall brood or, um, you know, chalk brood and also even the varroa mite. Because when the honeybees have propolis, uh, they have more energy to get a better immune system. I mean, you may feel the same thing, like when you are sick, so uh, you need to use, uh, that when our body is like producing antibodies against a virus or bacteria. So what happens is that most of our energy is being used for, for the fight, I mean, for the infection. And our body is using all the energy. That's why we need to rest and we don't want to do so much things. So uh, the same thing happens for the bees or the super organism, because when they have diseases, they need, to, they need a lot of energy to fight them. But the thing is that when they cover it with the propolis, which is an antibacterial agent and also antifungal agent, so they are free from most of the diseases. So they can uh, focus their energy for honey production or for, you know, the, for the brood expansion. And also like when they have a disease, they can easily fight because they have more energy to fight with those. But again, these are still under, under uh, you know, working. And for also human life, I mean, propolis has been shown as an anti, strong antibacterial agent. And it is not as old as uh, honey, but if you look at the name, which is propolis, which is the Greek name, so we can think that the Greeks have used propolis, I mean, for their, um, you know, for the treatment of different diseases. And again, the, there's a very important uh, element of propolis is CAPE, caffeic acid phenyl ester. So this active compound has been used as an antioxidant agent, so which is helping our cells, you know, to protect from different diseases. So I'll come touch base with those. Another one is the royal jelly. So what does royal jelly do? You know it, but okay, it's the queen. Yeah. So the royal jelly is produced by the honeybees in their frangial cell uh, the tissues. So they produce this and then they feed the queen and also the baby larvas in the first couple of days, they feed the, baby, uh, the bee larvas with royal jelly. But afterwards, if they continue to royal jelly, it will be a queen. If they don't continue with the royal jelly and they, they just switch to bee pollen or honey, sorry, uh, pollen, um, bee bread or honey, so then the, the, it will be a female worker or uh, if it continues to a queen. So, and it is increasing the size or the development of the queen up to 12 times faster than a worker bee. So for these reasons, I mean, royal jelly has been considered as a rejuvenating agent. And it has been added to so many different derma, um, you know, of dermatological products. And uh, also uh, royal jelly has been shown to increase the acetylcholine, which is important for our brain functions and memory as well uh, in, the, in the mice. So people use royal jelly, I mean, for, uh, for the memory functions and as well as for, you know, to have brain activity. But again, uh, and also royal jelly has been used for, to, for the treatment of fertility throughout the history as well. But overall, I mean, uh, to produce royal jelly, I mean, to get the royal jelly from the beehive, you really need to uh, concentrate your bees to work on the producing more and more and more and queen, more queens cells. And they need to feed the, the queen uh, caps with the queen cell. And then they need to keep, uh, you know, feeding them, although there was no queen inside it. And then you need to collect them afterwards. So I personally ethically stay away from royal jelly because it's, I feel that it is, not, um, uh, it is not like the way that honey is harvested. So it's like more kind of pushing the bees to make something which is not there. I mean, which is when they don't have a queen, but they still feed it like a queen. Anyway, the other one is the bee venom. Uh, so what is the bee venom is mostly used for? I know you heard about this bee venom therapy and it's becoming more and common arthritis. Arthritis, yes, great. So when you are, uh, when you are probably, all of you got uh, stung by the bees, right? If you are a beekeeper, you must have been stung. So <laughs> <laughs> otherwise you are not certified. Yeah. <laughs> so you got stung from different parts. And then uh, especially when the bees, uh, honeybees, then they stung from the joints uh, and it, it's been shown that it has been relieved the inflammation because the chemicals inside the bee venom is an anti-inflammatory agent. And as long as, and, probably you might have observed yourself as well. So when the bee uh, stings you, it dies. So the worker bee is the only one that has a sting. And then uh, when the worker bee stings, so it will die because uh, the, the, the guts of the bee will stay there with the sting itself. And then the bee will stay away and fly away. Half of the gut is left. 
but you may see that it is still there are still muscles pumping there and those muscles are continuing to pump the venom inside there so that's why when they do B, B venom therapy they don't remove the sting very quickly so they it stays there for a while to get the most out of the B venom but normally i mean most of the time we have inflammations uh, like the, you know uh, like edema uh, in where the bee sting is done and then this is because and the earlier you remove the bee sting uh, the less inflammation you'll have. That's why it's always recommended, uh, you know, when you have a bee sting, so just remove the stinger as soon as possible. So by just scraping it, not pinching, but just scraping it. And then, uh, so what do you do after remove the uh, bee sting? What is the best way, you know, to avoid inflammation or burning? Take Benadryl. <laughs> you can get Benadryl. It will take a while, about 30 minutes to kick into your body. But what else? Well, you can spray Benadryl there. But there is a better method which will prevent most of the inflammation there. And it is very natural. And you can you always feel that. that. You pee on that. You, yeah, this is the last resort. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, you can pee on the sting area, but this is the last. But there's another way, a more humane way, or like <laughs> more natural way. So as long as you have water with you, you can use this thing. So, but you're not, I'm not talking about washing it. Ice, ice. No, I mean ice. Uh, yes. Baking soda. No. I, I use mean, honey all the time too. Yes, you can use honey, but not as the first aid. You need to do one thing before honey. So, what do you have when you are beekeeping? What do you have around you? Like smoke. 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 You are stepping on it. Soil. Dirt. Or... Dirt. You put a little bit of water to the dirt, make the mud, and put on your head for the sting area. I got three stings last weekend. Uh, I was in Austin, and then I did not have any. I mean, I only have inflammation on this side because I couldn't. I didn't successfully remove the sting. And when I work with the bees, I don't wear gloves, so <laughs> I just smoke smoking. my hands. So smoking the hands is camouflaging enough. And I mean, I got three stings. Two of them because we opened the somebody else opened the hive without smoke and then they immediately attacked us and then and the other one was i squeezed one of the bees on the side and then she just sting me but anyway at the end i immediately used the mud within like less than three minutes so that when i covered the mud and then just kept the mud there until it drops down and then i didn't have any inflammation i didn't have any like little bit scratch i had but then you can get the benadryl which will uh, suppress other infant. but it's like the least um you know the least uh, ha um, harm can be done just by using the mud wherever you are. So just uh, put some water to the soil and then on dirt and then put on your head. And, is, is the mud drawing the venom out? Is that what it's doing? I think mud has different, but properly, uh, most likely the, there are fungus in the mud, like on the soil, there are other bacteria, there are also some other minerals in that. Probably, I don't know the, how it functions, but I know it works. So that's why maybe it's another study that we need to do. <laughs> okay, but again, bee venom is mostly for arthritis and all those diseases. Okay, so biological activities of honey. So we can have this kind of graphs for almost all the uh, bee products uh, because most of them has antibacterial activities. I mean, the propolis has it, um, the royal jelly has to some extent, but most of them has anti-inflammatory activities as well. As I mentioned, it prevents the demo. And the most famous uh, for the honey or uh, for also propolis, they've been used for uh, wound healing throughout the history. And it is interesting, uh, uh, that, you know, uh, in the folk medicine or traditional medicine, people used to use uh, oak bark or bark of the trees for the wounded area. And then uh, we found out that uh, the, um, the, the, the honey from that particular tree, like oak honey, is, has the same effect like the oak bark when you put on the wound healing. So it is interesting that it, uh, trees or flowers were used or if plants were used, but if you use the honey of them, you have almost the same effect because the honeybee is collecting those chemicals from those plants and putting into the honey. Anyway, so wound healing is the most famous one. And today you can see on the markets, on the burn uh, and wound units at the hospitals, we have, uh, do you know the brand of the honey that's been used? Like the brand of the bandage, bandage or Manuka is where it's coming from, but there is a certain brand, uh, especially if you work in the hospitals or in the burnings or wound units, it's called the uh, Medi Honey. Pretty easy to memorize, like medical honey, Medi Honey. So it's by the Integra Sciences right now, and then um, 
there's a very big market out there for the wounds because of the diabetic wounds, the venous ulcer wounds, and the uh, you know laceration caused wounds. So all these wounds can be healed uh, by using this made honey. And if you go to their website, you can see so many images. But I will show also some images at the end. So cardio protect protective. Remember the made honey. What does it do? Lower the blood pressure. So like made honey, there are some other honeys that can be regulate help regulate your cardiovascular system. And uh, actually, I'm teaching a class this year at UTSA in the biology department, and the class name is called The Medicinal Properties of Honey. So I have 20 students that are working together, and they are writing proposals, they are writing some articles about honey and cardiovascular diseases, honey and wound healing, honey and uh, diabetes, and honey and uh, cancer. So they're working on different subjects of the honey, and then uh, they, I mean, they will be they are, uh, looking into the articles that have been published. And most of the time, we see that the publications about medicinal use of honey has skyrocketed uh, starting about 2010. So it's only like 15 years old. But before that, we have most of the articles from Malaysia, uh, from uh, New Zealand and Australia. I'll check New Zealand was the leader because of uh, Professor Peter Mullen, who kind of introduced Manuka honey to the world because of his very high antibacterial activities, which is caused by the methyl glyoxal. So, and it, uh, Manuka honey is the most studied medicinal honey or medical grade honey, but it's not the only medical grade honey. So there are other like buckwheat honey from the United States or Canada. It's been also uh, well studied. I mean, not too much, but from this area. There are also other Kanuka honey or eucalyptus honey or Tualang honey, like they are from Malaysia. And Malaysians are the, one of the most uh, studying, the honey studying uh, country, I would say. Because when you search on the PubMed, which is the you know, database for medical journals, so when we look at honey and wound healing, so like about like 70, uh, 60 or 70 percent of the articles are published from uh, Malaysia. So they are working pretty intense on those fields. Anyway, so honey is antioxidant. So antioxidants are required for our cells to recover from uh, oxidative stress. And do you know what oxidative stress causes to our cells? If you have damage. Damage, yes. And this damage can be Aging, yes, aging is one of them. That's why hand is anti-aging, but also it may cause cancer because oxidative stress can cause mutations. I mean, the oxidative, the free, free radicals inside the cell, which are the you know the uh, end results of the met cellular metabolism. So those free radicals can cause mutations on the DNA, and if it is not fixed properly, and we have DNA, our DNA repair mechanism keep fixing uh, those uh, issues. So that's why we don't get cancer every day. But if the free radicals are increasing. Uh, like the, from because of the smoke or because of the industrial things or because of you know other uh, diets, so those free radicals can cause cancer. And then honey is antioxidant, so it is scavenging those free radicals. And it is honey is anti-cancer because it's preventing the mutations. I mean uh, the you know the formation of the mutations inside the uh, inside the cells. And the most famous uh, known property of honey is antibacterial. So it has been shown that honey is killing honey could kill almost any bacteria that has been tried on. And this number is more than 200 or 300. So there are so many studies showing that honey is, like also review studies, honey kills most of the pathogenic bacteria that cause a disease in humans. But the most importantly, honey can kill resistant bacteria. So resistant bacteria are, is a very, uh, like a very uh, dangerous uh, pandemic for the earth. I'm, say, I'm, like, I'm using the word pandemic because it is a pandemic coming up. Have you heard about AMR? Yes. Can you help us? Um, AMR stands for? Oh, methicillin resistant staphylococcus. resistance. Very good. AMR means antimicrobial resistance. So the, the, the microbes, I mean, they have the genes to resist for antibiotics because we keep fighting with them with antibiotics and they keep fighting back to us with the resistance genes. So the bacteria, especially the ones in the hospital, because they're exposed more to the antibiotics, they activate their resistant genes more. So that's why we have uh, a disease called hospital infection. And hospital infection is the number three killer in the US right now. But by 2050, hospital infections are expected to kill more than 50 million people per year. It's right now it is about a million, or 1.3 million. And that more than 50 million per year will be more than cancer and cardiovascular diseases. So antimicrobial resistance expected to kill more. That's why it's an ongoing pandemic. And the more we use the antibiotics, yes, we, do, we need to use them, but 
the uh, you know the more it, the host effects are increased, the resistance is going up and up more. And again, according to the World Health Organization, AMR has been uh, declared in 2016 or 2017, I think, uh, declared as an ongoing pandemic. And there have been lots of steps, uh, like kind of uh, regulations that have been made, especially in the United Kingdom, uh, not so much in the United States, but like the decreasing number of antibiotics. And also, as you know, antibiotics are mostly used for the, um, the livestock animals, uh, like uh, chickens and uh, pigs and the cows and so. So that when you use antibiotics on those animals, uh, it, it helps them to grow faster and without any disease. Those antibiotics, the bacteria live in there, they gain resistance. And then when we consume that meat, those resistant bacteria come to us and then they start living with us. And then we have a disease and then we use the antibiotic. So it doesn't work for them because they have the resistance. And in 2017, there was an alarming news uh, in Nevada. There was a lady, uh, she got infection uh, because of a Thai injury back in India and she came to Nevada. And then uh, she has given 27 different antibiotics. She 27 different antibiotics, they're all available in the United States. None of them work. None of them were able to kill the Klebsiola pneumonia that she has on, uh, on her body and her infection and she, she, uh, she died because of the, this uh, resistant bacteria infection. So, and again, this was an alarming thing because there were no deaths because of um, resistant bacteria in the US, but now it now is getting more and more. So honey is a very good solution for this because honey has been shown to kill resistant bacteria with different mechanisms other than antibodies. And also another thing is that honey is an integrative medicine product, which means that you can integrate or complement honey to the current medications. And again, there are studies, if you consume, if you get honey with an antibiotic, it will help, it will enhance the activity of all the antibiotic. Let's say honey is attacking to the cell membrane or cell wall of the bacteria, and antibiotic is attacking to the DNA of the bacteria. So by this way, they are working in a synergistic effect. So honey can be used with antibiotics and it may help more to fight with the diseases. And there's also a couple of studies about this. So the, um, you know, integrative medicine or also like complementary usage of honey with antibiotics. Yes. I guess the same argument could be made for the uh, vaccines that we cause mutations in the virus. It could be the same scenario. I mean, vaccines cause mutation deviruses. Well, it's forcing them to mutate. Uh, depending on the type of the virus or I mean, the vaccine that you are using. It's an argument. Yes, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> yes, it's an argument. Uh, I mean, I can't talk about it, but it's out of the side. That, you know, I mean, I can't talk about it. So uh, also honey has been used as a gastroprotective. So honey has been shown to help with the gastrointestinal diseases like the Crohn's disease or the colitis. And also uh, Helicobacter pylori, which is, which cause what? Do you call Helicobacter? Ulcers. The ulcers and gastritis, okay. So uh, Helicobacter pylori is the bacteria, which is an anaerobic bacteria, which means that it cannot survive when the oxygen is there. It lives just in the um, stomach when very, very, very little amount of oxygen so they can survive. So when you consume honey uh, with an empty stomach, like early in the morning, uh, when you wake up before eating anything else, honey has been shown to, uh, prevent or you know the treat the ulcer disease and also gastritis as well. Actually my mother was just diagnosed about two weeks ago with ulcer and I told her use honey in the morning and also use honey before you go to bed. So that by this way uh, your stomach can have enough power or you know your body can enough power so to fight with that one. But again that uh, I can uh, I can show studies about this. I will be happy to provide medical articles or you know biological articles about whatever I told. So I have I have a very long, very big library of the medical honeys. So again, this is one of the major um, reviews that uh, talk about honey, how honey has been used for the circle and modern. And as we see, it's mostly for uh, wound cells, type of gut diseases. Okay, this is an important thing here. Look at this, diarrhea and constipation. How can you use a medicine for both diarrhea and constipation? I mean, honey helps for both of them, but how does it do? I mean, like. Because if it causes the area to stop, then it should, it should make it worse for the constipation, right? It depends on the etiology of the diarrhea and the etiology of the constipation, I guess. Okay, that's true. The etiology is uh, an important word here, yes. So uh, honey has been shown to affect the gut microbiome. So gut microbiome is the bacteria that lives in our guts and then they are 10 times more than our own cells. And we have about like five pounds of bacteria living with us. It is part of our organ systems. It's one of our organs, you would say. 
So the gut microbiome has to be healthy for all, you know, so that we can have healthy guts and healthy, you know, bowels and so. So what happens is that when, the, I will show another slide later, but when you dissolve honey in water, depending on the water temperature, if it is warm honey or cold, so warm water or cold water, so the, the, ox, the uh, production of the hydrogen peroxide is being changed. So hydrogen peroxide, okay, maybe I should write the table, but so we, you know, honey has glucose in it. And when you dilute the honey in water, glucose is being converted to gluconic acid because of the enzyme glucose oxidase, sorry, too much chemistry, but also it produces hydrogen peroxide and it is about 0.3%. So normally we use hydrogen peroxide for wound cleaning, right? The cleaning the wounds or the session area. So uh, what happens is that, I mean, but it is 3% that we use, but honey has 0.3%, 10 times less. And it's a continuous production. So by this way, honey prevents the, you know, the fights with the, probably the bacteria that causes the diarrhea. And so when the honey is uh, dissolved in cold water, uh, it helps with, um, it stops the diarrhea or healing, and then honey is used with like, diluted in warm water. I'm not telling hot water. Remember, hot water kills the enzymes. It degrades the enzymes. So it's like, I always say warm water, like as long as your hand can stand with it, let's say 55 degrees or 125 Fahrenheit. So as long as your hand can stand, so when you dilute the honey in it, so it helps with the constipation, but it doesn't happen overnight. So you may need to use the honey for two days, three days, four days, so especially like, it will not dissolve your uh, bowels like an axetic, you know, like you're just gonna go, it doesn't go like that. It goes slow. So you need to keep using honey to have a better, and uh, to have a better, you know, gut system on fire. Anyway, so yeah. it can help both. Can I ask, um, if you put honey in hot tea or coffee? Very good question. Yes, that's that, what I was expecting. <laughs> does that degrade the honey too much? No, uh, I mean, yes and no. If you are using honey as a sweetener, not a medical product, that's okay, because you are getting the glucose, fructose, and uh, sucrose from the honey as a sweetener. Right. But uh, as you recall, I mean, honey has uh, enzymes, in it, active enzymes. And according to the biology, I mean, uh, the enzymes, they will degrade in high temperatures. So the, the glucose oxidase, diastase, invertase, I mean, all these enzymes are required for the ripening of the honey, for the, you know, hydrogen production. I mean, also for the, you know, uh, B defense in end, like proteins. So they all degrade it when you put them in hot water or hot coffee or hot tea. But again, if you put the honey a little bit when it is like warmer, again, if your hand can stand with it, so you will save most of them. So if you put it directly into the hot liquid, so you may you are still having a sweetener, you are still having the honey, but you may lose the activities of the enzymes. So that's why I personally do not use with very hot water. But when I need to do, so that's how I do the um, warm, uh, warm honey to drink. So what I do is like, I just, I put the honey and put about half glass uh, with regular water, like uh, room temperature water. And I dissolve the honey a little bit, then I add a little bit more hot water into it. So it will just adjust the temperature. So I don't put the hot honey direct, hot water directly, but I first start the uh, solution or dissolving with the regular uh, room temperature water and then add more hot water on top of it. So it will be, like we still save the property. Anyway, so honey has been used for eye infections. So like conjunctivitis, honey has been used for control of acute fever, like um, it can control help with the fever. And also it's been used in the modern medicine, it's been used for helicobacter pylori treatment and also wound healing and treatment of cancer or aviation chemotherapy treatment. So as you know, in the when the cancer patients, when they have uh, chemotherapy agents, uh, as a, a side effect or adverse effect, so they will have mucos, mucolitis, which is the inflammation inside their buccal mucosa, so uh, in, inside their uh, cheek. And then it will, uh, it will have the inflammation, of, it will also cause infection eventually. And then that's why they need to use some other medications to treat it. So it has been shown that the, when the cancer patients are getting honey and like leaving them in their mouth for a while, so the, the effect of mucolitis has been decreased significantly. So that's how like uh, it just alleviates the side effects of chemotherapy by this way. And also honey has been shown uh, when, uh, you know, when the irradiation and radiation therapy is uh, you know, applied for the cancer, uh, different uh, tumors. So that radiation can also burn the skin when it's passing through. So if you apply honey onto the burned skin because of radiation, it has also been shown 
to decrease its uh, its effects, and then the, the skin is much uh, like remains much healthier when compared to the unapplied honey. So again, honey helps for these like that's why it is a very good complementary agent for the cancer therapies. And I mean, don't buy this. And sometimes people say, okay, if you eat honey uh, for a cancer, I mean, when you have a cancer, if you eat honey, you are simply feeding the cells with energy. No, it's not true. Because honey is not a major, uh, is not the primary energy source. And we, we know this through this way, because honey has a very well balanced of glucose, fructose, and sucrose major sugars. So it, it is a hypo, it is a um, low glycemic index. So if you are familiar with the glycemic index, so high glycemic index means that it goes into the blood right away. Like when you eat sugar or you eat chocolate, it will increase your blood sugar very quickly. That's why when you feel uh, hypoglycemic, like dizzy, so you just get a chocolate or something and then it will just, or a candy, it will increase it. But if you consume honey, because of low glycemic index, it will go into the blood, but in a slow manner. And most of the glucose coming from the honey is stored at the liver as a glycogen. And then from the liver, it is being released in a steady manner. That's why honey like remains, honey's sugar remains in the blood longer than other like sucrose or candies or you know other chocolate sugars. So it's a low glycemic index and it helps uh, you know for the body. So the cancer cells don't use it as a food product immediately. And honey has been shown, but honey has been shown to use for, for the treatment of diabetes as well. And um, under the control of the doctors, I mean, if you have a doctor here, but uh, under the control of the doctors, I mean, the medications. So honey can be used uh, as an alternative carbohydrate uh, in, uh, in the, within the diabetic patients. And uh, again, it has been shown on, these are personal experiences. I don't know about the evidence base yet, but uh, the people like who have diabetes, that they consume honey before they go to bed, so it helps our it, it helps the body to uh, use the uh, honey's gl glucose and fructose overnight, and then when they wake up in the morning, their gl uh, glucose level is not too high. So it's the brain because the brain is still active during the sleep time, and brain needs the glucose, and it comes from the liver glycogen because liver is the one controls the glycogen to be sent to the brain at night, and then when you consume honey, you are providing some fuel uh, for your liver. So it can be used for the brain. And then that's how like honey has been uh, like kind of effective for some type of diabetes. I cannot say type two and type one, all of them though, no. but there are still studies going on with this, especially in the mice. There have been very promising results that have been uh, coming to honey. And again, these are the two different articles that show that honey has been used in the medical field. So in 2016, there was a, art, a review article and the Cochrane collaboration is that a very reputable journal among the doctors, uh, which is combining clinical trials in certain subjects. So in 2016, they covered the honey as a topical treatment for wounds. And they combined, like, they collected, like, uh, dozens of different clinical trials from different parts of the world. And they concluded that honey is a very good healing agent, but still more clinical study needs to be done to confirm it is, you know, it is by itself, it's a wound healing agent. But honey is being used for, like, there are four stages in the wound healing. Uh, like the, the debridement and uh, like prevention of acute inflammation and uh, proliferation of the cells around them. So those all for those the, all four stages, honey has been shown to be effective. Uh, you know, to uh, for the faster wound healing. So normally in the wound clinics, they use four different medications, four different methods for each steps or wound. Healing. Anyway, and then also uh, it has been shown again this twenty eighteen. So when the kids, uh, especially the toddlers, when they have a, a cough, uh, you know, a, when they are coughing and they have an infection in the throats, so when they are given honey, they have better sleep at night. They have, uh, you know, less coughing at night. They, like they, their sleep quality was much better. And when they wake up, they were more energetic. So when compared to the uh, cough medicine only. So honey, when it's used by itself for the kids, and probably when you were a kid, <laughs> Maybe so many years ago, but so probably your parents have given you honey when you have when you are cupping yours. And actually, I always give honey to my daughter before she goes to bed and when she wakes up uh, because she goes to school all the time and catches different things, you know, like if that's not happening in schools. But anyway, so that's uh, again, honey has been shown to be effective, and these are very like very important reviews because it is it has been published in highly reputable journals. And again, uh, this is about why honey is important, like as an antibacterial agent. 
But the most important part is the organic antibacterial compounds that is coming from different flowers or uh, you know plants and nectars. And uh, high sugar concentration doesn't allow the bacteria or virus or fungi to live inside the honey, but the spores can survive. And, um, and also some uh, fungus can live on top of the honey. That's why we have foaming uh, by the time because, the, because of the fermentation due to the presence of yeast or some other uh, you know, fungus on the top. So if you have foam on the top, I would recommend you to remove it before you eat the honey itself. So that foam can have some fermenting agents or like the gases coming out of the room. But anyway, so the acidity of honey is also pretty low, so the, which most of the bacteria doesn't like it. So they cannot survive in it, or I mean, they, at least they stop growing it. The hydrogen peroxide, I already mentioned it. So it's an important wound healing agent or antibacterial agent and the organic antibacterial compound. All these things contribute together for the biological activity of honey. So biological activity means antioxidant, antimicrobial, and anti-inflammatory activities that can be, you know, um, find out in, 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 an, in any uh, agent. Again, these are the bacteria that has been killed by honey. These are these. Uh, bacteria has been uh, collected or cultured from the wounds of the patients. So, you know, most of the time, if a wound is not healing by using antibiotics or by using medications, if wound is not healing, most likely there's, an, there's a resistant infection or there's an infection which is not being, you know, being well treated. So when, they, uh, when there's a wound that they culture, uh, you know, the bacteria from those, it has been found that 23 different bacteria has been isolated and all these wounds were healed by application of the honey. And I'll show some images of those later. But most important one is like honey was able to kill MRSA and MRSE. So these are the medicine resistant stuff bacteria. And then uh, honey has been shown to kill them on the wounds of like in human clinical trials. And this is about, this is about the wound healing study that I was mentioning. Our time is up, I think. How, how is the, I mean, I can have questions. I can continue. Thank you for Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, if you have any questions, meanwhile, just uh, feel free to ask. Uh, I can talk about honey and you know medicine for three hours, four hours, but <laughs> so I don't want to keep no, you. Yeah, want to sell for <laughs> okay. So this is about the wound healing study. Again, uh, these are some graphic contents here. If I, if you don't feel comfortable, feel free to put your head down. But anyway, so uh, this is this study has been done on 102 patients. This one is back in early uh, 2002 or 2003 in Malaysia. So uh, and then they used the honey as a last resort therapy. And uh, actually, I was part of one of the articles. That's why uh, I, I'm using these images. So they tried the oral and intravenous antibiotics. They would wound debridement and wound resting agents, and they also used COVID, COVID and iodine, like the um, you know the modern wound dressing. None of them has worked for these patients in the wound clinics. So they use the honey as a last resort. So either they will amputate the organ, like a leg or arm, or they will let the patient die because of sepsis. So they use the honey as last resort. So how they apply the honey, so first of all, they clean the, uh, the wound area with 10% honey solution uh, so that they can clean off the dead cells and soft out cells and the bacteria there. And then they pour the honey because this wound is pretty big. As you can see, the fist can fit here. So it's a pretty big wound. It's a, um, I will show that it's a hemiparalysis uh, uh, wound uh, on the patient. So they pour the honey and they just cover it with the uh, gauze pad and then they cover it, uh, they do the dressing on top of it. So, and then they change it like uh, twice a day or sometimes three times a day for the wound healing. And what I put to this patient, uh, I'm gonna show that one. Oh, this image was, Okay, this is how it is being used. So this is the company that is the, the you know, if you want to get any of these, like, I don't know if it is sold, it's not sold in, oh, it's sold in Amazon if you need to use. But I prefer to use my own honey or like the buckwheat honey. Sterile product has a thinner consistency than the gel, which is very suitable for deep tunnel wounds or for wounds with undermining or even for impregnating onto a clean antimicrobial gauze or non-adherent dressing and then applying to the wound. So this is showing how it's used. It is recommended to use metahonic paste with a secondary cover dressing, except in cases like certain burns or mouth wounds where your clinical judgment comes into play. 
as we demonstrate on this model of a sacral pressure ulcer, after properly cleaning and preparing the wound, meta honey paste can be applied directly to the wound bed. This model is an example of a more serious wound where tunneling and undermining has occurred. In cases like this, it is important to make sure the meta honey dressing has direct contact with the varying wound surfaces. Here, we use biogard tunnel strips to move meta honey into the tunnel, ensuring contact with the undermining area. In cases like this, it is important to make sure the meta honey dressing has direct contact with the varying oh, wound surfaces. Here, we add meta honey calcium alginate to cover and fill the wound bed. Be careful to keep the product inside the wound edges. If the depth of the wound requires it, dolls may it. choose to further yes. fill the wound bed. Because the, again, the thing is that honey has to be excess I and mean, touched to the. To uh, finish, edge. we use extra sorb non adhesive foam as the cover dressing to offer absorption, cushioning, and protection. So this is how the meta honey is being applied. Again, uh, you can find it uh, online. And you know how much is Monaco honey when compared to, I mean, how much do you sell your honeys for mostly? Not enough. <laughs> not, enough. not enough. Like $8 <laughs> per pound, $10, $12? $10 per pound. $10 per pound. And you know how much Monaco honey is, how expensive the Monaco honey? $80. It's about $120 per pound. Yes, so it's about like 10 times more than what you sell, but it's still the same. It's still honey. So, like the, honey. sorry? Seems like cream. It says, yeah, Monaco honey is more cremated because they add some other it, 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 things to make it gel. But when you open the Monaco honey, it doesn't smell like honey that much either. And when you consume Monaco honey, it's like, and depending on the you know, different levels, like they have 5 plus, 10 plus, 15 plus, and 25 plus. Each of them has different amount of MGO in them. And again, uh, like, Monaco honey, because of its mark, uh, like research based on it for about, almost 30 years, and also good marketing and uh, promotion values. So also like the media honey, which uses Monaco honey for the wound feeling. So that's how it become more and more like uh, expensive and more harder to find. And do you know how much Monaco honey is being produced per year? I mean, there's a joke about this. It's, it's, Monaco honey is produced about 10,000 tons per year in New Zealand and some parts of Australia. And you know how much it's sold per year? 100,000 per 100,000 tons. So it's like it, it sold 10 times more because of the adulteration. I mean, they blend it with other things and they still sell it as one. You buy it on eBay? Yeah, if you buy on eBay or like from other places. I just, I just bought Amazon, sells a half an ounce for 10 bucks. Half an ounce. So is it correct? Like 120? Okay. So it's still more expensive. <laughs> Thanks for watching. So uh, this is an hemorrhagic uh, bed sore. So this is this is the same patient that you have seen in the previous one. So there, uh, there's a lot of like inflammation and pus in this uh, in this area, and then the cells, I mean the, the tissue is almost dead, and the, there are tunnels as you have seen it goes inside. And you can see some stitches around here. The doctor says try to keep the wound the, like not open the wound, but those stitches didn't work. And it's got, you can see better here what the stitches looks like. So it didn't help. So after the application of honey for one week, as you can see, the whole it there is a fresh tissue coming out under the from the body. Uh, I mean from this like this hemorrhagic again a bed sore on the uh, hip, and you don't see any more bacteria, you don't see any more dead cells, and it's a fresh tissue, and it is like it shows uh, like strong uh, like you know uh, indication of healing after one week, and after three uh, on the week three, I'm sorry week two, you can see that. That there's more coverage on the top of the uh, you know the wound, and then it is getting shrink. It is shrinking more, and no more infection, no more dead cells, no more mal odor or like bad odors coming from because uh, the bacteria is completely gone. And then the week, fourth week, uh, you can see the epithelialization start on top of the wound, and then this wound was closed completely on week seven. So and again, this patient was going to lose the the leg because this infection cannot be stopped. And eventually, it will go into the blood and it will cause sepsis, which is resulting in death within 24 hours or so. So that's why, I mean, uh, and I'll show another one. So this patient has been covered, recovered from sepsis because this patient has got three, uh, two amputations before. Sorry, three amputations. So this is a 26-year-old male with a uh, diabetic wound. 
with multiple amputations. So they first he had the uh, wound on his feet, and then they cut the feet. And then he got infection on the leg, they cut the leg from the knee. And they got another infection on the thigh, they cut it from here. There's no more to cut. I mean, now it's on the abdomen area. As you can see, this is the, uh, the upper thigh area and groin area. And then you can see there's lots of infection, uh, like the bacterial pus and then the dead cells. And, you know, there's almost no way to uh, you know, save or rescue this patient with the uh, current medications. And then when they start applying honey for one week, as you can see, it's like there's, uh, sorry, I think this picture. So as you can see, the, the, the pus is mostly gone, little bit infection left, and the fresh tissue is coming out of here. So which shows the, a significant improvement on the wound. And then this is the week three, as you can see, it's all like fresh tissue now, normal bacterial infection. And then on week four, because the wound is so big, they, they make a skin graft from the other leg to cover and uh, rescue the patient. And again, this patient was survived, I mean, uh, rescued from death or from sepsis uh, just by using honey only. They using regular honey or using medicine? Yes, this Malaysian study, they used toalan honey. So not manuka, they used toalan honey. And um, it's also called, uh, I mean, there is one thing called medical grade honey. So normally the honey is, you can use the raw honey directly. I mean, I personally use raw honey directly when I have a, like a cut on my finger or anything on my hand or body. I just, uh, or there's a, like, if you, when you burn your hands or uh, arms and putting things in the oven and so if you're not a good cook like this so I just like so i just put honey there and then put the bandage up the body so you can use raw honey that way but for the in, in order to be used in the hospitals then it has to be medical grade so remember i told that spores can survive inside the honey because of their very strong cover so those spores can uh, resurrect or revive when you put the honey on the skin so they can just start proliferating and the bacterial infection can happen. So to prevent this, they apply, they sterilize the honey by using gamma irradiation. So it's not boiling, it's not gas, it is gamma irradiation, it kills the spore, uh, you know, the spore formation. So but then it's called medical grade honey. But again, that medical grade kind of honey is not only manuka, there's toalan honey, there's bulmo honey, there's like, uh, I think there's another honey in the UK. So they all have medical grade honey is available, but the most famous one is manuka. And this is what slice from a stick bite. So the guy has uh, like a very bad slice up here uh, and then he got infected and there is no way that they need to amputate the whole arm. So after one week of treatment, uh, his wound got much better, no more uh, bacterial infection and the fresh uh, tissue is coming up. And after in the third week, the wound is almost healed. We don't have the uh, picture for the fourth week. You know why? He ran away from the hospital back to the States. <laughs> so we don't have the full real one, but yes, this is, uh, you know, again, this is so. So there are so many other images on this image, but I don't know, like, I'm not going to take your time with those. You can always find wound healing and honey. And when you Google search it, you can see so many different treat, uh, like applications of it. Like, in, like, even it's, for example, not in the US, but also some other countries, but for example, in India, they put honey after the C-section. So, you know, they keep lay, uh, cutting different layers to get the baby out. And after that, so before they close the last lamina or the fascia, so they put honey in between and then they stitch it up so that the wood, it doesn't get any infection. And then the best thing is there is no seam left. So there is no scar tissue left there. So because honey helps the uh, wound to heal without leaving any scar behind. But it's not applied in the US. So. So anyway, in summary, honey kills the bacteria at the side of the wounds. It cleans up the wounds like the brightness. It uh, rapidly kills the, like a place to slow the dead cells. And the most, I mean, one of the most things is it enhances the regulation and reapitalization and absorbs the edema and also prevent uh, infections in the, uh, in, this, uh, in the area as well. So again, honey is like, for this reason, honey has to be used as a for first, uh, you know, application instead of last resort. So honey can be applied in the wounds. And again, there are some, like there are hospitals uh, that they use uh, midi honey because it's a medical grade honey and it's sterile and everything. It is all well designed for it. And they use it for, uh, as a first treatment on this. Now I like this work because honey is a remedy we discovered. So honey has been used for thousands of years, but it was kind of deserted for about more than a hundred years uh, after the discovery of the antibiotics and other medications. And now within the last three decades, honey has been rediscovered as a remedy for human kind. Okay, so nobody asked which honey. 
I said, medical grade honey, but not all the honeys are created equal. So uh, each honey has different properties. Uh, based on our studies in Michigan and nowadays in Texas, honey, we try. So uh, according to our findings, I'll just skip them very quickly. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll be wanting to show them. So there are honeys with different colors and with different shades. As you can see, it can be water white all the way to bark amber. And the, the, uh, we found out, I mean, I mean, according to the studies as well, so the darker the color, the higher the bioactivity potential. So that's why like the honeys, which look, which doesn't look like honey, which is like very dark amber color, like a buckwheat honey. So it has the highest medical potential. It has the highest bioactivity potential to be used. And it doesn't mean that the lighter colors don't have, lighter colors still have some medical properties, but maybe they can be used for like uh, small scratches on the hand, but not for large wounds. So a buckwheat honey can be one of those. And according to our studies, we found that buckwheat honey has the highest bioactivity potential among 150 honey samples analyzed. And we also get some Monica honey. Uh, I think that we got it from Amazon, uh, 25 plus Monica. And according to our studies, like the, it, um, all honey was the second, chestnut was the third, and twilight honey from Malaysia was the fourth. And Monica was almost number 10 in when it is like in the combined bioactivity potential. Again, Monica honey has very strong antibacterial activity but its antioxidant activity is not as high. So uh, that's why it's under number 10. But buckwheat honey has been shown to have very high antibacterial activity and very high antioxidant activity. And that's why it got the number one. Again, this was from Michigan. Uh, for, and all honey was from Turkey and chestnut honey also was from Turkey. And toilet honey was from Malaysia. And this is the buckwheat honey. It doesn't look like honey. It doesn't taste like honey. It doesn't smell like honey. It tastes like medicine, it smells like medicine, it looks like medicine, so that's why it's... <laughs> it's good on pancakes. Yes. Oh, okay. So this is the buckwheat, and this is the oak uh, honey, how it is like, it is the, I don't know if you can, I can, anyway. So this is how it is the effects are like scraping. So oaks don't have flowers, but they can collect it. And these are the buckwheat. And if you have like, if you have um, acreage and if you want to make a crop, um, but the cover crop, uh, you know, you can always use buckwheat there. And in Texas, buckwheat is like raising pretty well, especially when it is uh, used like throughout the late summer, early winter, early spring, so early fall. And then uh, the bees can still get, uh, you know, still get the nectar from the buckwheats for quite a while. Okay, so at the end of my slides, I'd like to thank to uh, the Department of Integrative Biology that's I'm an assistant professor of practice now. The Texas Beaker Association, because they discovered me when I was first came to San Antonio, and I, since then I'm giving talks about this. Alma College, where I did most of my studies for the medical grade honey. And right now I'm doing the honey, uh, I'm doing the research for uh, Texan honeys for their medical properties. So, uh, I'm, and I have collected, uh, we have collected about uh, 90 samples now. And then, um, so we'll be analyzing them with my students in the medicinal properties of honey class. So hopefully we'll get those results by the end of uh, this year or by the end of spring. So uh, you can see how the Texan honey compares to other, to other milk grade honeys. And I'd like to thank my, um, Dr. Kamerton Yusuf. He is the Malaysian professor that he started the Honey Research Center in Turkey and I joined him. And our uh, university is present at that time. So uh, they have, like he invited me to Turkey to join the honey group. So I appreciate their you know, effort for this. So that's all about me. This is my email address. Uh, if you want to contact me, or um, yeah, and then also you can scan this one to record, uh, you know, to have my contact email. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll draw these. Uh -huh. I know you're taking your honey from Texas, but you're also doing research with Texas honey. You have enough samples. Do you need anything from Houston? I'd love to have some from Houston because I decided to make it only San Antonio, but I end up only 35 samples. Yeah. So probably they are collecting tonight because they have a meeting today. So I told them I'm, I'm in Houston, I cannot join you today. But so yes, uh, I can have um, like about 10 to 15 more samples. It's like as a good uh, you know variety. And I would like to see that one. Normally I was planning to expand the whole Texas uh, in my second round, but probably I still can get samples. And uh, we'll have a sample. At least four ounces. And I'll be happy to share the form with Mike. Uh, so there's a form that I would like to fill out, like when did you, the harvest time, the geographical location, if you know the bee strain and your contact information, if I need more information. So there's a form that if you, it's a very quick form. 
So you can fill it up and then you can send your honey sample to my address at UTSA. And again, uh, it's on the, um, I'll be happy to, uh, you know, share those information with you through the email. So again, uh, feel free to send me samples and we'll start analyzing them probably next week uh, for the antibacterial, but we'll, it's this continuous process, not only begun in one week. So we'll keep analyzing for the next couple of weeks for antibacterial, then we'll be into antioxidant and finally we're gonna do anti-inflammatory. So by the end of the course, we'll have more than 100 uh, 100 Texan honey is analy analyzed, and I mean, your honey can be one of those, maybe the winner. I don't know, but I don't want to say winner, but one of the maybe good honey is the candy. Yeah, I think um, again, uh, this is like this. Oops, not this. Yeah, if you use your camera um, for the phone. This QR code will make you add my information to your cell phone directly. It will save it as a contact with my cell phone number, with my email address, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I'll, I'll hang around with it more. No, I just want to be sure that you include Travis Tallow product. It's, I don't have the sample if you had. Yes. What type of you have it? Chinese talent. So you said warm water and honey for constipation. constipation cold cold for the area. For the area. Yes. Yes. So I am curious about when you were talking about the medical grade honey and the irradiation, and it, it would just kill the fungus spores. But the spores of the bacteria. So does it not do anything to the enzymes no, or anything? No, like it has been. There is a, There was one study that is showing, especially the medical honey, when they have irradiated versus un, unirradiated one, there was no difference in the bioactivity potential. Wow. But especially antibacterial properties. Okay. So it only attacks the DNA of the bacteria. Nice. Okay, thanks so much for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Right, can I borrow the microphone back from Oh, yes. I'm just going to go. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I'll switch that back here to do that. Okay, great. Okay, a couple of quick announcements, then Mike will do the. Thank you very much, by the way, Dr. Osler. That was fantastic, and uh, I think we all learned something, probably more than we're going to remember. So I guess we'll have to look this stuff up, and I, I'm probably going to send you some honey, honestly, yeah, if it's any good. Yep. I know <laughs> what it's like. Okay, so mentor program, it's on our website. Um, send an email in, uh, basically fill out a form there, and uh, and uh, we'll get you hooked up with a mentor or, or help you, you can become a mentor. Um, and then the upcoming events this Saturday, Mike's doing his deal. And then uh, Brazos Valley Beekeepers has theirs also. Is that what it is? Yeah. And then next Tuesday is Harris County Beekeepers, followed by the 18th, which is our beekeeper meeting. So, all right. Door prizes. Uh, also, if you're going to come out to that uh, October meetup in, on the 22nd, Texas Bee Supply wanted us to get an accurate head count. So, we're doing the uh, event right registration just like we did for the uh, summer social. Um, so, let's see. We're just gonna do it by chair. So six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Me? Yeah, you. Hey, Bia, cool. <laughs> and then two gentlemen in the green shirt back there. That's you. Y'all just go back there and grab whatever y'all want off that table. Uh -huh. I got a couple of hats, a hive tool, and a uh, y'all are gonna get royal checkers for like the next 12 months. And then 10, <clears throat> six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You, yeah, you. I think you have four things back there. Do I have four? Yeah. Two hats. Oh, I can't count. Yeah. That's, that's it. Public education with UT. Get you. Two more nine. Can't have the same one. What? No, I can't have one. Number one. Yep. You. 
Get your face hat, man. That's perfect. Look great on you. All right. Thank everybody for coming. See you guys uh, next month. Sure. This week. Yeah, if, if you want to come out this weekend, we're going to meet at, at the Walmart at 146.910. My apiary there doesn't have an address. And if you do come out, just remember that apiary is just an empty field with bees on it. There's nothing out there. Well, I have some shade set up with some water.